hemp protein has some really interesting functionalities that I think make it suitable for, you know, your new generation of these meat analogs, the burger imitations that I think have gotten really good, um, protein bars and things like that. It actually tastes good. You know, at the end of the day, if it, if it doesn't taste good, the rest of it doesn't matter. That's Benjamin Raymond, Director of Research and Development at Victory Hemp Foods in Kentucky. This is the Lancaster Farming Industrial Hemp Podcast. My name is Eric Herlock. And today we'll hear my interview with Ben Raymond. He's a food scientist and has a really interesting understanding of hemp as an ingredient. We'll hear about the work he does at Victory and the products that they make, and also how the company works with farmers. But first, let's take a quick sponsor break and then come back with a few nuggets of hemp news. Farming is local, and so is King's Agri Seeds. They've been screening products for local adaptation since 1993. Using the research farm in Christiana, Pennsylvania, Kings is working to ensure seed varieties are fit for the East. Hemp is no different. Whether you are growing for grain, fiber, or CBD, Kings AgriSeeds has got you covered. Give them a call at 717-687-6224 or go to kingsagriseeds.com. Okay, welcome back. So I've got a handful of hemp news nuggets for you. The first one comes from Hemp Grower Magazine. They are reporting that Kentucky State Senator Adrian Southworth introduced legislation in the state to increase the allowable amount of THC in hemp to 1%. The story says that while the USDA's final rule maintains its 0.3% THC limit, Southworth, who assumed office January 1st, is hoping that may still change at the federal level. And if it doesn't, she's hoping Kentucky can lead the charge in helping other states make the change at a local level. Southworth's legislation to increase the THC level, Senate Bill 113, goes in tandem with another bill she has proposed called Senate Bill 112, which is meant to prescribe procedures for the testing of hemp, provide procedures to include an appeals process, and provide options for remediation or recycling hemp when hemp or hemp products exceed the Delta 9 THC concentration threshold. Together they would be amazing, but both bills can stand on their own, Southworth says. All right, here's a story from hempindustrydaily.com that was originally reported by Capital Press. The story says that John Iverson, a 34-year-old grower whose family farm grows industrial hemp and other crops, has been elected to serve as chair of the American Farm Bureau's Young Farmers and Ranchers Committee. The third generation farmer and graduate of Oregon State University will act as spokesman for the Young Farmers and Ranchers Committee and will sit on American Farm Bureau Federation's board of directors during his year long term. Congrats to John Iverson. All right, and last but not least, the National Hemp Association this week released its response to the Biden-Harris Climate Action Plan, a plan that identifies a handful of policy areas that need to be focused on to address the impending climate crisis, you know, including things like infrastructure, the auto industry, public transportation, the energy sector, housing, building, agriculture. The Biden-Harris plan talks a lot about creating jobs, bringing manufacturing back, rebuilding infrastructure, you know, all the stuff we should have done in the 90s. So as you might imagine, many of these areas sort of line up perfectly with what hemp can offer. So the National Hemp Association says, to demonstrate the many ways hemp is truly America's next natural resource, the NHA has produced and submitted to the White House, the USDA, and the US Senate Committee on Agriculture an action plan detailing how hemp can be incorporated into the major climate initiatives identified by the Biden administration. So I'll have a link to that document on the show page for this episode. You can also find it directly at nationalhempassociation.org. But I just want to read this section here because it makes a really good point. Industrial hemp is one of the last truly bipartisan issues left in Congress. For the left, it represents sustainability and economic empowerment. For the right, it represents a rejuvenation of American manufacturing and agricultural might. This can be more than a fleeting moment of political agreement. Hemp has the potential to be a point of unity in a deeply divided country because it is something that both sides actually agree on. The hemp industry equally benefits rural and urban Americans. 
and its soaring popularity is evidence that, even in times like ours, cooperation and mutually aligned incentives can lead to progress. The creation of the U.S. hemp industry is a victory for our republic and could possibly help inspire unity and compromise elsewhere in our society. Hemp may be the only bipartisan issue left in America today, but that doesn't mean it has to be the last. And speaking of hemp and victory, Ben Raymond from Victory Hemp. Welcome to the Lancaster Farming Industrial Hemp Podcast. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Um, so first, could you give us like an introduction of yourself? Where are you from? What do you do? That sort of thing. And then we'll get into Victory Hemp. Yeah, I'm a, uh, a mountain man. I grew up in the mountains of Vermont. I lived there for most of my childhood into college, studied food science at the University of Vermont, went down to North Carolina, did a master's in food science, uh, started my career doing botanical extractions in the natural color space, met uh, the Victory guys. And then, uh, you know, I, I kind of had a, an interest in hemp and seeing how that market was going. And then all of a sudden, this really great opportunity fell in my lap. So I've done product development for food ingredients for, for quite a few years now. Um, my products are in, you know, brand names that, that I probably can't tell you because of the NDAs, but you know, certainly you've, you've definitely eaten products that I've, I've developed and I'm bringing my expertise to victory to make better tasting, uh, better functioning hemp food ingredients. Wow. That's cool. Yeah. Awesome. Well, welcome to our show. Um, uh, so tell me about victory hemp, you know, what's it all about? What, what do you make? Yeah, I think it, it, it all kind of started with a dream with uh, Chad Rosen, our CEO and founder. Back in 2014, you know, the, the farm bill passed and hemp was legal all of a sudden. So he moved to Kentucky because we're one of the first states to, to embrace it. Um, Mitch McConnell was pretty instrumental in, you know, getting the farm bill through. Industrial hemp. So Chad set up shop in Kentucky and figured he'd be a hemp farmer and then realized that, you know, maybe processing was the way to go. And it's kind of grown from there. We incorporated as Victory in 2016. And we've really grown quite a bit in the last few years. And a lot of that's pushed by the, that V line of products. So that's the, the latest and greatest protein and oil that we make out of the hemp seeds. Okay. Well, uh, tell me a bit about that line of products. Yeah, it's it, it, the way we manufacture, it's a little bit different than your traditional cold pressed oil and then the resulting protein products. So we, we get a really nice light flavor, light color. Um, we see its suitability for a wider range of products than your typical kind of green hemp protein cake or, or protein products. So, you know, the, the interest is from uh, food, food manufacturers that maybe wouldn't be able to use a traditional hemp oil or, or protein because it's got a flavor that's hard to cover up or, you know, perhaps objectionable for, for a wider market. So um, that's just through physical processing. We don't do any, you know, solvent extractions or, any chemistry that I think would probably make consumers uh, unhappy. It's a pretty benign process. I would call it, I would say it's minimally processed and, and I can say that with a straight face. It really is. Okay. Um, and it has anything to do with the varieties of hemp grain you're, you're going after? Or? There are certainly varieties that we find taste better and are easier to process, but we, we do handle, um, I would say typically there's, you know, your mainstays, um, your X59s and CFX and CRS, but then there's some new ones coming onto the scene that we do process, but um, we do look to make sure that the, the varieties are, are suitable for our process, but you know, it's also making sure we're asking our farmers to grow varieties that are going to make them, you know, some money at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. um, the answer is sort of, it, it's getting more mature and more sophisticated, but it's still pretty early. Okay. Um, and some of those products that you're making and are they, you're distributed um, nationwide? Like, could I go up to my, my giant up here and, and get some Victory Hemp products? Um, unfortunately not. We, we started as a consumer packaged goods company. We were making little bottles of oil and pouches of protein and hemp hearts. Um, now we sell primarily business to business. You can buy um, bulk ingredients on our website. And those are, are typically five pounds of dry goods or a gallon of, of the oils. Um, and then for the V-Line, that's actually exclusively sold through our strategic partner, Applied Food Sciences. Mm -hmm. They're a, a firm based in the U.S. and they've got the, the exclusive rights to that product. Cool. Okay. Um, so a couple of months ago, I interviewed a writer by the name of Doug Fine. He, uh, he's, he's, got, he's growing hemp out on a ranch in New Mexico and he, yeah. he calls hemp, you know, superfood. 
right? He's like, I'm growing the superfood on my ranch. So from your perspective as a, you know, food scientist and you know, like nutritionist, yeah. what is it about hemp that sort of sets it apart from other ingredients? Like why is Doug Fine calling it a superfood? Yeah, <clears throat> I think it's probably helpful to, to think about the categories of products you can make out of it. Um, from the oil perspective, it's super high in polyunsaturated fat, fatty acids. So relative to like, a, um, say a palm oil, which is super high in saturated fat and, and you know, very useful for processed foods. Um, hemp seed oil is 20, 25% omega threes. And then, you know, it's, it's this, people talk about the, the ratio of fatty acids and, you know, they're being an ideal for human health. Um, I don't, I don't know if that research is, is super conclusive, but certainly it's interesting and, and points to, uh, keeping a balance of fatty acids in your diet that isn't totally out of whack and skewed to one direction or another, um, you know, super rich in omega nines, but with very little omega threes. Yeah. That looks like it might not be so great for human health. And, and hemp kind of falls right into that range where it looks really promising to maintain, you know, optimal health, cardio and, and the like. Um, so that's interesting. There's some other minor phytonutrients you find in the oil. You know, you have some tocopherol, some, uh, cytosterols, which, Think of them as kind of a, almost a plant cholesterol, but they look like they might have a cholesterol lowering effect. And mind you, all these things are, are definitely not not a, not a evaluator approved by the FDA. And I'm, I'm not claiming any sort of it will make you healthier, but they all look interesting and they're all things that you know consumers can read about. And then from the protein, um, it's quite digestible for a plant protein, very complete. Um, it's, it's limited memory serves and lysine, which is you know, an amino acid that is actually commonly limited in plants, but, you know, very easily combined with other ingredients and made into a really complete nutritious protein. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's got some functionality too, that I think is really important that you can't gloss over. If a protein is, is really, you know, has a, a great health effect, that's one thing, but if you can't put it in a product that people want to eat, it doesn't really matter. And hemp protein um, has some really interesting functionalities that I think make it suitable for, you know, your new generation of these meat analogs, the, you know, the, the burger imitations that I think have gotten really good, um, protein bars and things like that, where it's, it actually tastes good. You know, at the end of the day, if it, if it doesn't taste good, the rest of it doesn't matter. You mentioned palm oil. Um, yeah. Palm oil sort of has a reputation of being like terrible for the environment. Like they're, they're, they're stripping out rainforests and putting yeah. in, grove. So um, could hemp be a replacement for that hemp oil? You know, in some respects, yes, but in a lot, no. Um, palm oil is is very stable and it's great for making processed foods. You know, it, it's got a very high smoke point. Um, it's oxidative stability is really good. And those are all attributes that if you're developing a cookie that you want to last on a shelf for three months, you know, longer than a cookie would regularly last, um, that's a good technical fit. But obviously there is the baggage where, you know, the slash and burn plantations, it, it, it's, it can be nasty stuff. Um, hemp oil, because of its super uh, concentration of, you know, polyunsaturated omega fatty acids, isn't nearly as stable. Um, it's more of a, a salad oil. It's useful. Think um, places that you would use extra virgin olive oil, mm. hemp oil is a great fit. So I probably wouldn't fry with it unless you want to set your kitchen on fire <laughs> but you know it makes it makes great salad dressings it's great on popcorn actually it's got a nice buttery flavor yeah. on its own um but yeah it, it without refining it and really doing some some pretty heavy duty processing it's probably not a, a great direct replacement hmm. okay um i have to tell you that over the summer i made a tomato salad for my family you know just chopped tomatoes some basil some yeah. garlic and normally i put olive oil in but yeah. I grabbed the wrong bottle and I, I put in hemp oil yeah. and I'm like, oh, maybe they won't know. But, oh, they knew instantly. <laughs> and there was like a near mutiny at the kitchen table. But why did you do this to us? <laughs> exactly. Dad, why did you do it? Yeah. That, I mean, that's something about processing hemp seeds. Um, traditionally, whole hemp seeds or ground up hemp seeds are fed into an expeller press, which is really just a screw in a barrel. And you squeeze and squeeze and squeeze until you get oil out. Um, it's a great process from the perspective that you're not using organic solvents or, you know, strong alkalis and things like that. Um, but you crush them up with the seeds and you get a lot of phytonutrients that maybe don't taste so great. Some, some extra flavor. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, your chlorophyll, 
which gives it that nice green color. Um, that breaks down when it's exposed to light and makes some funky tasting stuff. So, you know, those are all things that I think hemp seed processors have to work on. Um, and also the, the breeders and the genetic side. Mm-hmm. You, know, you can only do so much if it, your starting material has those flavors in it. Um, is Victory working with other parts of the plant besides the, the grain? Tangentially, um, it's really not our focus, but certainly you, you can't be in the industry and not be aware of, you know, the uh, potential for fiber use. It's mm-hmm. really finding the right varieties and then the right markets for it. Cause that, that is a very mature, hyper competitive space. You know, you're competing against synthetic fibers and then cotton and, and a bunch of other stuff that's, I mean, they're entrenched. Yes, they are. Yep. Um, so not really, you know, we're looking at uses for the shells because we've got lots and lots of shells. But <clears throat> yeah. So what do you then do with sort of like the waste stream? Like what, what happens to the rest of the plant? Yeah. So it really depends on the farmer. A lot of them will, will plow some of the plant back under. Um, it is, you know, it looks like there might be some, some use in kind of forage for, you know, their livestock. Um, but that gets into a little bit of a sticky area cause it's not really approved uh, mm-hmm. by the FDA CBM or AFCO for use in, you know, production animal feed. Yep. So, you know, like, like the rest of the industry, that's, that's a little bit gray. And with the Hemp Feed Coalition, Victory is working to, to change that. Um, we really want to make sure that we have those outlets. But yeah, uh, it can be a challenge sometimes. And one of the things that we're working on is generating less low-value co-products mm-hmm. uh, and, you know, more of the high-value products that can go to human nutrition through processing on the front end. But a lot of that's going to come down to breeding, too. Um, you know, we're, we're a hundred years behind corn and soy, so we've got some yeah. catching up to do. Yeah. Um, you mentioned FDA approval, um, for both human and animals. Uh, what, where I talked to Hunter a couple of weeks ago about, you know, the, the feed hemp feed coalition, but where, where is it with the FDA for human consumption and how does that sort of restrict what victory is trying to do now? Yeah. So I'm not, not a regulatory expert. I know enough to be dangerous. So don't, don't take this as uh, um, any sort of legal advice, but the FDA has a grass process where you basically gather a whole bunch of information on your product. It's composition, expected use and consumption rates. And you said um, grass generally regarded as safe. Correct. Yes. Okay. Sorry. I, I can also speak in uh, food lingo <laughs> sometimes. Um, so basically you gather all this information about it. Sometimes there's feeding trials where you feed it to rodents or, you know, another animal, but you look for uh, potentially negative effects and you compile all this. And then there's, there's two routes. You can submit this dossier to the FDA and they'll come back with questions or not. And not having questions is essentially a tacit approval. It's as close as they get to saying, yes, this is safe. Um, you can also choose not to submit that dossier and just have put it a, in front of an expert panel of toxicologists and nutritionists and they all sign off on it and say, you know, this looks good. Um, But being ready in case the FDA questions you and grass um, status, I guess has been not, not objected to by the FDA for the protein products, the oil products. um, And then as well, some of the the other minor ones. Um, So those came through a few years ago. Um, We're doing our own group grass submissions for all of our products just to, you know, be safe. Mm -hmm. But certainly the FDA sees hemp products as long as their main concern is making sure there are not appreciable levels of cannabinoids in them, as far as I can tell. Um, So, you know, we we test for it. But otherwise, they they seem to be taking the stance that it's acceptable for human consumption, the grain at least. Yeah. Yeah. And there's generally never any THC in the seed. You know, I, I can't say never, but it really doesn't appear that the seeds themselves, um, any of those tissues make cannabinoids, but certainly there is always a risk that you get a, a hitchhiker from another part of the plant that makes it through processing. Mm. So we do not see detectable levels of any of your, your major or minor cannabinoids. Um, but if it does happen more than likely, you know, there's some, some sticky flower material that's, mm. that's taken a ride through the process. But okay. Yeah. The seeds don't make THC at all. Go ahead. Um, so how does Victory Hemp work with farmers? Are you contracting them or do they, are you growing your own seed? You know, what does that relationship look like? Yeah, currently we, we contract with, with a handful of farmers. Um, we're always looking for new farmers that want to try growing hemp. 
um, or hemp farmers that would like to grow hemp for us, we also spot buy on the market. Um, so it's, it's a little bit of a two pronged approach, but quite a bit of our acreage is contracted ahead of time. Okay. And that's, you know, that's part of the challenge is building up this, this market. So we've got a product that we can sell, but you know, the supply chain is also many years behind, you know, your traditional row crops. So yeah. we're working to, to speed that up. Are those farmers you're working with in Kentucky? And like, how many acres are you contracting? You know, I don't actually know the current acreage count, so I, I don't want to give you something that's inaccurate. Okay. Fair we've enough. got contracted acres um, up in Michigan, and we've got contracted acres out in the Dakotas and then in Kentucky. So those are probably the three kind of major regions that a lot of our stuff is grown in. Mm -hmm. And certainly we're, we're working to expand it. But, you know, one of the things that we're seeing is all these grain varieties I say all, but the majority of them have come out of Canada, Eastern Europe, places that have climates that tend to be shorter days and, and a little bit cooler. And that seems like it, it, it sort of wreaks havoc with the, the growing cycle when you get too far south. Hmm. But time will tell. Right. And that might that issue might be alleviated with, you know, more research in varieties and get some varieties Absolutely. that do better down here. I would expect so. Um, yeah. You know, it, it, it really depends on the plant itself, but certainly there are plenty of other crops that have been adapted to growing from Florida up into Canada. Not all of them, you know, you, you don't see any Florida wheat, but certainly um, hemp has proven to be pretty adaptable. So I think, I think with some effort, um, some effort and some money, and you know, that it looks like those things are, are coming in okay. pretty aggressively. So good. Um, and can you talk about like how, how you contract with farmers? Like when do they get paid, you know, or I don't know any, any information you can, you can give me about how you work with the farmers. I'm going to, I'm definitely going to push that one a little bit because I am, I'm very much the processing guy. Um, okay. Certainly I would be happy to follow up with a little bit more information for you to share with your listeners. Okay. Um, you know, as said, and especially farmers that are interested in growing, I don't yeah. want to, I don't want to say anything misleading. So. Okay. I'm, fair enough. No. Yeah. Um, I, I like to ask guests how farmers can avoid getting the short end of the stick when it mm -hmm. comes to getting involved here. Um, yep. Would you have any, any thoughts on that? Sure. I can offer some thoughts there because I think, you know, there's a philosophy within Victory that, that hemp grain is really um, a key part of the future of hemp. Um, certainly CBD and then in states where there's marijuana, those are two different, two, two, two almost entirely different um, ways of growing and handling and processing. And we fit more into a more traditional agriculture and, and food processing. Um, certainly you're not going to get rich fast growing hemp grain, um, but we think that there's a pretty stable market for it and that it's growing. So I would say, you know, you got to look at what your tolerance for risk is. And I would recommend that you consider planting hemp grain if you're planning to get into hemp. Um, maybe plant some CBD too and, and, you know, play around with that if you want. But the other thing that I would say is make sure that you're, you're looking at your genetics carefully. Um, there's always the, the push to get maximum yield if you're growing for CBD. And sometimes that gets people in, in trouble with hot crops, um, hot being, you know, testing above mm -hmm. the 0.3% limit for THC. So good genetics. Um, and then, you know, find a company like Victory and, and get some contracted acres. That's a good way to, to, to dabble in it. Are you importing any seed? you know, foreign seed or is it all domestic at this point? Certainly we're looking at genetics from all over the world, but anything that we've had grown commercially has all been planted and grown in the U.S. Good. Yeah, we, we like our Canadian neighbors, but we, we, we need to uh, get our own market off the ground right now. Yeah, amen to that. So what kinds of questions do you get from farmers or potential farmers or even consumers or potential consumers? You know, one of the most common questions is, you know, is there THC in this? Am I going to get high eating this? And the answer is no, you know, unequivocally, absolutely not. Uh, that's a common one. People want to, I mean, when you talk about farmers, they want to know how deep you plant the seeds. When do you plant them? You know, what sort of water? And then, you know, also looking at your, do you need to fertilize them with anything? Well, you know, what sort of soil is amenable to it? And some of that information is, is relatively well established. And some of it, you know, we're really on the bleeding edge. Um, so we always answer as best as we can, but there's a certain level of, um, you know, unknown. Um, we get a lot of questions about, you know, just what do you do with this stuff? How do you use the oil? How do you use the protein? And the answer, and that's why I go back to, if you could use olive oil there, you know, 
try hemp out. And if it doesn't work there, you know, maybe, maybe you should try the protein. The protein is really, I think the game changer. Um, people are looking to incorporate plant protein in their diets and, and, you know, move away from animal protein. And certainly this is another way to do that in a way that is, is, you know, good for the soil, good for farmers and, and good for your waistline. So, so the protein, is that a, a powder or how would like your typical consumer interface with um, hemp protein? Yeah, I think uh, a typical consumer could absolutely just go, go Google hemp protein and order some from, from, you know, us or a competitor online. Uh, but certainly you're finding it in more and more products that are coming when I say those like package goods, so a protein bar or a drink mix, you know, even a, a vegan, you know, protein supplement, things like that. And then certainly the, the growing plant-based, you know, meat analogs. So the, the beyonds and impossibles of the world and all of the similar products that, that seem to be popping up more and more by the day. Um, and certainly, you know, it seems we've done some work in our labs and it, it seems like some of these proteins actually make quite a nice, uh, burger patty, if you will, hmm. um, with a, you know, a little bit of extra help, some seasoning and, and that kind of stuff. But, but we've, we've had some really good preliminary results where it's like, you know, I would, I would eat this and, yeah. and be quite happy with it. Okay. Yeah. Um, when you first sort of got into doing uh, research with hemp, was mm-hmm. there anything that just like, like surprised you or sort of blew your mind about what you were seeing in your research? You know, I was surprised at, how little focus was on hemp grain considering the potential and that it really, you know, the focus of the industry seemed to be really CBD heavy and there's nothing wrong. You know, I'm not going to disparage CBD, but it's like, why are we not looking at all the things that the plant can do? And now that you see a lot more people that are going, Oh, you can do CBD and grain and fiber and it, it does all these things. But I was sort of blown away that a lot of that basic research isn't there. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's still true for some things. You know, if you, if you go out to the field of literature that you can find on hemp, um, it's a puddle compared to, you know, the ocean that is on soy and corn. Yeah. So there's just, it, it, there's a lot to do. There's a lot of research to be done. Yeah. That's what 80 years of prohibition will do, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, you, it's really been stymied. I mean, it was, it was locked in the back and not allowed out. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, from my perspective, um, yeah, CBD is is wonderful, but yeah, the future um, has to be in grain and fiber. Well, there's there's just so much consumption, right? Yeah. The, the fibers can go into so many different products. The the grain, you know, once other processors figure out how to do things that that taste almost as good as what we do, you know, that market's just going to explode. And CBD is, you know, there there is a cap to it. There is only so much CBD that that you can take as a person and as a nation. Right. Uh, and I don't think we're, you know, I don't think we're there yet, but certainly we're very far away from the amount of protein that, that is consumed and could be consumed mm-hmm. and still be, you know, in a healthy fashion, not, not over consuming. Right. Um, so what are some of the more creative or like non-intuitive uses that you've seen in hemp as a food? We've seen some interesting ones. We've seen uh, mustards that incorporate hemp seeds, which I wouldn't have thought that it was any good. It's actually a really great product. Um, hemp pretzels. There's hemp seeds actually going into my uh, my wife ordered some baby food for our son, and they have a you know a hemp hemp one that has hemp hearts in it, and you know they're they're advertising it for its omega three nutrition, which I think is really neat. I wouldn't have thought about hemp and baby food. Yeah, right. But it, it goes into all sorts of stuff. Uh, basically, if you can imagine a food being made out of it, it is. We've got a, a customer that makes, uh, uh, not sure if it's actually vegan or it's just vegetarian, but basically a non-dairy ice cream using hemp seed oil. Hmm. And it's really fantastic stuff. Um, the mouthfeel is, you know, it's, I don't get me wrong. I, I, I love some real dairy ice cream, but <laughs> it's, it's impressive. And I think, you know, if, if you can imagine a use for it, it can fit into just about any bucket. Right. Um, you talked a little bit about, you know, people asking you if they're going to get high from eating this, but do you think yeah. like that marijuana stigma, does it really matter anymore or should it matter? Or how does it, how did it affect victory or the industry? You know, I grew up in a state that, that is pretty, um, 
your your conservatives and your liberals tend to be relatively libertarian leaning i think so you know if it doesn't if it doesn't kind of step on my toes it's not my problem and you don't see that around the country certainly so i think yeah there's a stigma and people are concerned about it and hemp in general um i don't think the the u.s population really knows what to make of it yet i think it's changing rapidly and i think you know people are exposed to it more and more especially states legalize recreational marijuana and or just have because some are still not there yet but yeah there's there's a stigma um certainly we see it i see it on a daily basis when we talk about companies that make processing equipment or lab equipment um, you know I've, I've been asked to submit everything from my entire business plan and every sop that we have and you know just really really information that you wouldn't ask another food company to share because they're concerned that we might be growing marijuana and you know diverting our profits to gangs and couldn't, you know, couldn't be farther from reality. Uh, but certainly, yeah, there's, there's a, there's a stigma attached still. It's changing and it's changing rapidly. I mean, you know, you have people's parents now that they're like, Oh yeah, I, I have hemp seed oil in my kitchen. It's like, no way. Never, never thought that. But so I think people are becoming more and more comfortable with the plant in general you know, not just hemp, but, you know, the idea that it's, it's, I don't know, I, I don't think it's a gateway drug that's, you know, going to cause everybody to lose their mind when you're talking CBD, THC, et cetera. But certainly when we're producing food, we do have to remind people that it doesn't have THC in it. And some of that manifests itself and our regulatory burden is quite high. You know, we do a lot of testing. We test our raw materials, we test our finished goods, and not just for pesticides and mycotoxins, your regular ag things. We're testing everything that comes in and out of our plant for THC, CBD, and then 10 or 12 other minor cannabinoids. Just so that we've, you know, we've got some, some good footing to say, no, it's, you know, it's definitely not in here. Or if it is, it's, it's in really, 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 really low levels. So, you know, kind of non, not consequential. Um, the final rule that just came out last week. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? And those final rules affect um, some of your regulatory burden? Yeah, they, they do. Um, we're probably not as, as upset about them as some other producers that are, are more focused on CBD, but certainly we would like to see a little bit more of a, essentially a safe harbor in case you do have a crop that tests, tests positive. Um, you know, for us, if we have a farmer growing grain and their plant tests, you know, above the legal limit, it's, it really doesn't, I don't think it doesn't matter a whole lot. They're not processing the rest of that plant into CBD. It's all coming in as grain. And if that gives them better genetics, great. But certainly, um, you know, this is, this is definitely my personal soapbox. I, 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 it's hard for me to fathom growing this agricultural commodity crop. And then I have to send it off to a lab that's registered with a drug enforcement agency. Like there's the FDA I get the USDA I get, and you know, the host of other ones, but, it, it's a weird, weird regulatory soup that you have to deal with. And I, I wish that burden had been lightened a little bit more, but certainly um, we're taking steps in the right direction. So overall it was, it was a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you mentioned earlier the hemp feed coalition and I gather you're on the steering committee of yes. hemp feed. Uh, so can you tell me how hemp as an animal feed intersects or overlaps with hemp as a people feed? Yeah. So in a, a similar path that a lot of oil seed and, and also, you know, other, other products, um, you make co-products, you know, it used to be byproducts or waste products, but obviously to be competitive, you need to derive some value from, from the whole plant. It's also, you know, it, it's good for the environment. You're not wasting the stuff, not landfilling it, but it intersects. And, you know, if you're processing canola or canola oil, um, there's a ready-made market where that cake that comes out of your expellers is fed to animals. Um, whether they're hogs or, you know, cows, whatever, we can't do that right now in, in hemp. We can't feed it to rabbits. We can't feed it to sheep. We can't feed it to, you know, dairy cows or beef cows or basically any sort of production animal. And obviously that's a lower value outlet, but it's still somewhere that you can get some value back. And, and, you know, it's a good place to funnel this off to. And certainly it seems like there might be some interesting health promoting effects of supplementing a diet with hemp cake. Um, 
So it's really a way for us to take the parts that aren't as valuable for human nutrition and have a market for it. So it's really important. And, you know, it, that's true for anybody that's processing hemp grain, whether they're Canadian, American, us, or competitors. Um, so that'll help us to develop the market and help to have an outlet for those products. You know, certainly we're taking the approach that we're trying to minimize the amount of, of those low value products that we make, um, you know, just for, for business sense, but certainly it, it was probably a happy coincidence with our production process that we just don't make as much of this material as some other processors. Mm -hmm. um, so what's on the horizon for Victory Hemp? We've, we've got a whole lot of stuff in the pipeline from an, an R&D perspective. Um, you know, some of which I probably have to kill you and your listeners if, if I share it. <laughs> yeah, don't do that. I got, no, I got no, too much no, to live for. No, I guess. And probably a bad joke. So um, <laughs> there's, there's some interesting things, some different protein products, different grades that have different functionalities. So we're trying, you know, keeping the theme of minimally processed. There are things that we probably won't do that you could do with proteins, different ways to modify them and, and make them do interesting things from a food production perspective, but we're going to stick to, you know, as minimally and naturally processed as we can. Um, but, you know, different products that are suitable for different applications, whether that's a grade that's got better solubility for, you know, drinks or a higher protein content because you need it in your extruded product for, you know, making stack buffs, um, that kind of thing. And then also looking at ways that we can valorize our co-products and make, um, you know, whether it's other chemicals or whether we can make different food products or supplements or something out of them that um, gets as much value out of the seed as we can, you know, and that's because that allows us to pay our farmers more. And, you know, the, the more people are being paid for their grain, the more acres will get planted. So, mm -hmm. um, but there's, we're, we're, you know, we're expanding our production capacity of our flagship products um, quite a bit this year. And there's, I would say victory in general is, is just kind of growing as fast, as fast as we can run. Um, so, you That's know, great. trying to manage that is, yeah. is just a huge part of it. Yeah. Um, how badly did the COVID shutdown affect operations for you? You know, it, it has definitely been more than a hiccup. Um, everything from packaging supply chains to just moving bulk loads of hemp grain, everything's been impacted the whole, whole way. Um, we've had employees that have gotten sick from office employees, guys on the production floor. And, you know, we, uh, pretty early on, we, we took a, um, I would say really conservative stance as far as, you know, implementing mask wearing and, and distancing and, and trying to be really conservative, um, and take it very seriously, but certainly, you know, we did, unfortunately, we had an outbreak in our plan. We had some employees get quite sick. You know, nobody died. Nobody has any permanent issues, but, um, it's, it's had a real impact. And then every time somebody gets a sniffle, you know, what do you, what do you do? Do you send them home? Do they immediately go get a COVID test? How long do they stay out of work? These are all questions that, um, you know, I'm, I'm a scientist, but I'm not a doctor, you know? So I feel like I'm, I don't even know enough to be dangerous, but sometimes, you know, it, I'm probably the best resource that we have, or, you know, some of our other scientists to interpret this. And, and, you know, as a general population, people are just trying to figure out what can they do safely? You know, what's, what's okay. Can I see my grandparents? And that's absolutely affected our business. Yeah. Um, I, we are, we are definitely eagerly awaiting uh, an improvement in, in COVID conditions. Yeah, I think we all are. And, uh, Hopefully that's coming. I think it is. I think I think we're on the yeah. I'm I'm uh turn a corner. I'm resigned to optimism. So yes, things are going to get better. It's going to be a good year. Yeah. Um. So where in Kentucky is your processing facility? So we are located in Carrollton, Kentucky. Carrollton. Um, okay. Yeah. If you were to to take a, take the map, look at Louisville and Cincinnati, and kind of drop your your pointer right in the middle. Okay. Um, so it's about 45 minutes north of Louisville off okay. of Interstate 71. Can you describe that facility? Yeah, it's um, it, it's it's like if you took a bread box, but you made it really big. So it's nice <laughs> and hot in the summertime. Um, it's a little bit chilly in the wintertime. It's not nearly big enough for our purposes. We're, you know, we're kind of, uh, as we're fitting new equipment in, it's a game of Tetris, but, you know, with big, big industrial equipment. So it's, I mean, it, it's it's a nondescript building you wouldn't know that we were there if it wasn't for our hemp you know our bins of, of grain outside that have the victory logo on them. that's kind of the giveaway that 
they're not just, you know, it's not just another nondescript uh, industrial building. Yeah. And then I think that's probably, you know, because we do food, we're not trying to be showy. And, and you know, if it, if it's not making a better product or, or making it faster or less expensive, it's, it's kind of just extra. Yeah. Yeah. You know? What's it going to take for like the big food companies to get interested in, in hemp as a, an ingredient? I think that, that you'll see um, consumer pull, you know, people are, are interested in buying products that have hemp in it. And I think as that grows, um, they're always looking for some sort of an advantage, new product development, and in a way to, to get a, an edge over the competition. So that's new flavors and that's, you know, new, new sources of nutrition. And I think we check a lot of boxes. Um, it's hot right now. And it's it, from a nutritional perspective, it's, it's really, you know, it, it's fantastic. But then the functionality is going to be a big thing. Um, you know, consumers in, in a previous life, you know, we used to say if, if a food product um, doesn't taste good, consumers won't buy it again. But if it doesn't look good, they're never going to buy it. So, you know, we need to do both of those things. And that's, you know, with a, a product that's lightly colored, you know, from the oil or the, the protein. So it's easier to incorporate into to a bunch of things and not turn them a muddy brown, but then the flavor, the flavor and the functionality. And I think you'll see that as you get more expertise in the field. Um, I'm not the only food scientist working on hemp, but I think you'll see more and more and you'll see more, you know, it's, it's really a matter of, of resources. You need smart people that, that have, have money to work on these projects. And you're seeing that come in and you're seeing support from the USDA you know, they just announced a, a large sustainable ag systems grant. So there's, it, it's, I think it's happening. It's turning the corner, but research, lots of research. Mm -hmm. um, how about the supply chain? Like, where do you think the energy needs to go in developing the supply chain? I think we, you know, we need to look at improving the yields of these, these grains. You know, right now, I think if a farmer gets a thousand pounds an acre, that was a pretty good year. And you know, so at the end of the day, if I can grow a thousand pounds an acre of hemp, or I can grow 10,000 pounds an acre of corn, or, you know, you can measure it in 200 bushels, whatever the farmers, I, I think at least the ones that I know, you know, the, they're not growing hemp because it's, it's a neat thing to do. They're growing hemp because they see it as a, a way to, to have a profitable farm. So we need higher yielding varieties. We need varieties that, that really taste great. And then we also need to start thinking about breeding for characteristics that, that help them to process better. Um, so, you know, shells that are more resistant to shattering and transport. So obviously once the shell breaks, then the hearts start to oxidize and taste funky and that can lead to all sorts of issues down the line. So it's kind of a materials handling and, and yield, I think are, are the biggest ones. Um, and, you know, the, the other thing is right now, and a lot of hemp processing, we're, we're kind of repurposing equipment that was made for some other smaller grain, you know, so the cleaning equipment was probably made for canola or, or something else. And does it work? Sure. But I think you're going to see more and more specialized equipment that's more efficient and, you know, can handle higher volumes and produce a higher quality product as grain, you know, grain handling companies and, and kind of other people in these spaces get, get into it and realize that this is a, you know, a real crop that they need to, to support. So what do you think? Five years, 10 years? Like when do we hit, you know, like full production? When does it really accelerate? You know, that's a, that's more than a million dollar question. That's, that's a million dollar question, right? I think we're already starting to see it accelerate quite a bit. If you, you know, you're looking at that growth curve, I think we're starting to, to hit the hockey stick, but I think five years for sure before it's really, really big. And it kind of depends on who adopts it. Um, as soon as you see a, a bigger kind of ag company decide they're really going to do this, I think it'll, it'll go a lot faster. You know, so if you have an ADM that says, Hey, you know, we're going to start dealing in hemp protein, that'll, that'll necessarily accelerate things. Um, having that level of expertise and, and the resources available make a big difference. And, you know, that's just, just an example. There are plenty of others that, that could do that. Yeah. But yeah. I think, I think it'll be one major company that decides they're going to do it and it'll, it'll just rocket ship. All right. Is, are there other, um, groups that you're in or, that you're involved in that you would want to talk about, or is there anything else I should ask you about the work you're doing? Yeah. I mean, we're, we're a part of IFT and we're a part of, um, AOCS, the American oil chemist society. 
AOAC. So it's kind of standards, standards and methods groups. Um, and that helps our customers know that, you know, if we're testing our product, we're using a validated method that, that they're getting reliable, repeatable, trust, trustworthy results. I think that's very important in the food industry. Um, we've seen this proliferation of cannabis labs and we, you know, we, we do potency testing and that kind of stuff, but it's important for us to, I think, be in food. You know, we're different for sure. We're definitely kind of the, the, the weird cousin right now, but we need to be part of, of real food manufacturing and, and, you know, larger scale agriculture. Yeah. The, the really interesting things I probably can't, can't share on the, uh, the podcast. <laughs> but, you keep but, saying but, that. I'm like, come on, I want to oh, know the secret stuff. <laughs> yeah. The, well, the, the secret stuff is, is unfortunately it's the secret stuff. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, there's, there will be things coming out for sure. And, and certainly I'd be happy to, to chat again. We've got some stuff to announce that that's maybe ready for public consumption. Well, cool. Um, well, let's keep in touch. I look forward to hearing some of those secrets yeah. as they become public. Yeah. Benjamin Raymond from Victory Hemp. Thank you very much for your time today. It's, it's great to meet you and to talk to you. Thanks for having me. It was great. Okay, that does it for today's show. Thank you all for listening. And thank you to my guest, Ben Raymond at Victory Hemp. Also, I want to do a couple of shout outs. Uh, first shout out to Andrew Bish and his mother, Christy. Um, I met them both last week as they were traveling through Pennsylvania. I want to shout out to Dale Norley at Tasunka Farm in Chester County. Thank you for letting Andrew, Christy, and I walk around the farm and talk about hemp. I look forward to connecting with Andrew here on the podcast soon to talk about Bish Enterprises and Hemp Harvest Works. Also a shout out to Ernie Toke from Little Spider Studio in Chester County, Pennsylvania, who is letting me try this new microphone that he built. Sounds great on my end. I hope it sounds good out there for you all listening. Also a shout out to Dallas Berry out there on the West Coast who checks in with me periodically and lets me know how things are going. So thanks, Dallas. That's it for me. My name is Eric Harlock. I'm the digital editor at Lancaster Farming Newspaper. Check us out online, LancasterFarming.com, and follow us on the Instagram at LF Podcast Hemp. All right, until next time, see you in the newspaper. Episode 117 of the Lancaster Farming Industrial Hemp Podcast is copyright 2021 by Lancaster Farming Newspaper, which is part of the Steinman Communications family. Today's show is written and recorded, edited and produced by Eric Herlock. The music you hear throughout the show, as always, is brought to you courtesy of Tin Bird Shadow. <laughs>